Okay. All right, you guys. So this is the September meeting um, of the Historic Preservation Commission. So to kick it off, um, I guess if you want to review the last meeting's minutes, which was the meeting back in June, so we can uh, approve those. trying to up the volume. So, Anne, in terms of a motion for the minutes, only those that were in attendance at that meeting will be able to vote on them. So up at the top, okay. it shows who was in attendance. You should okay. still have enough members to be able to vote on them. Okay. Um, everybody's had a chance to review them. Uh, is there anybody who wants to do a motion to approve? I so move. Jane. Okay, do we have a second? A second. Michael, okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, and it looks like we don't have any public hearings tonight. Uh, do we have any visitors? No visitors. Okay. So I guess we will move on to new business, which we do have a demolition uh, recommendation for 12 Camel Avenue. If you guys want to review the included information uh, regarding this. So typically, Anne, I just do a really brief um, using the memo and letting you know it's um, in an existing single family dwelling. It was built in 1900. Um, there were no records pertaining any historic uh, inventory sheet or history on the property. Um, it had not been on any of our previously identified at-risk property um, lists. The, stories of, uh, the, stru the structure is a one and a half story frame dwelling. It's about 1,310 square feet. Um, they did submit photographs identifying the existing conditions of the structure. Um, and they did purchase the property just this summer with the intent to demolish. Um, you'll see the various information that they provided in the packets, um, including some photos of the existing house. Um, and if there are any questions, you can let us know. would appear that there aren't any historic relevance to the home. It didn't look like it to me. Yeah, nothing that we could find on file um, appeared to not have anything other than there might be some older windows. Um, but other than that, no specific architectural detailing. Um, Probably other than the windows. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it said in there that the power has been shut off to this property for three years. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely just fallen into neglect.
Does anybody have any additional questions regarding the property? And does anybody want to uh, start them up by um, sorry, does anybody want to approve the demolition request or deny their uh, request? I move we approve the demolition request. I second that. So, Ann, you can't actually, as the chairperson, second anything? Oh, okay. So someone else would have to second. Allow me to second that. Okay. <laughs> All those in favor of approving demolition requests? Aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Can I ask a quick question? Sorry, yeah. just for my own knowledge, what would happen if one of us did oppose? The Sorry, majority rules, correct? Decided to vote no? Yeah. Yeah, so there's a process that gets started. So if you decided to vote no, um, you would have to tell us what the reasoning was. So if you believe that there was some history to it, that had not been found. So for example, they can say that there's no history, but you might know that um, you know, there, there was an architect who had designed the house in you know, such and such a year and we can hold them. Well, you all plus staff does research. And then okay. based on that hold, we have certain timelines uh, in the code that say, Here's the first hold time frame, and if that hold time frame gleans some information that allows you to potentially nominate it, you'd be able to nominate it for um, a historic structure. So you'd be able to. There are steps that you could take, um, and each of those holds has a time frame um, that can be, I think, if I remember correctly, up to six months or so, um, which sometimes hold, you know keeps someone from demolishing it immediately or automatically. So we do have that ability if you had something that was important that we okay. would be able to do. All right, thank you. I, I, I said I, I was just curious. I appreciate yeah, no, it. It's good to um, remind people of like what we have in the ordinances and what, you know, we, if there was something important, staff probably would have identified it for you. We've done it, you haven't had one recently, but we have identified at least one in the past that we had concerns about. Um, but we were unable to find anything very specific. We had a little bit of information, but not enough to really warrant a oh, full no, not right. <laughs> nomination. I'm sorry, Karen, did you I'm need sorry. To... No, I did. I have a question as well. Is it, uh, are they under obligation to have an occupancy inspection they always? Are. Yes, what we do is we require that so that the pictures we can determine, are they truly pictures of the interior of that house or not? Okay. Um, there's been a little bit of a concern in the past that the pictures seem to show something that might not be completely true, especially when we've had, um, sometimes you can still find the realtor photos that show that it's a perfectly you know, occupiable house mm -hmm. and that occupancy inspection helps us to understand a little bit better and confirm. And so the list that accompanies that inspection is always a part of yes. our decision making. Okay. Yes, you are always gonna have one of those. So Anne, technically you have voted on this. So we can move on, but I want to make sure if, if anyone has any other questions, I'm happy to answer those. I don't see anything and we have no additional attendees. So we're good to move on. Okay. Oh, sorry. I'm going to go back to the agenda. Ah. Hold on. So I'm going to jump for a second off the agenda, just as a quick heads up to everyone. So I don't know how many, you know, we had a couple months where we didn't have enough members attending. Um, we had a recent member 
who had joined Dee Dee and scheduling wise, she did not realize she had some things that came in that conflicted. So she had asked, um, had said she apologized and she was not gonna be able to serve. She let the city council know a couple months ago, um, they did do one interview of someone at the last council meeting, but he has withdrawn that he's not gonna be able to do it. Um, we have, um, two new applicants that I believe are gonna be interviewed next Tuesday. One is someone who um, moved away from Webster Groves, has been gone for about six years, but used to serve on HPC yeah, um, and did some projects and was very interested in coming back on, as well as one of our architects on architecture review board, who is, her focus is on historic architecture. Um, she had asked if she can serve on both. So we are confirming that she's allowed to serve on both commissions. Um, and if so, she is also going to interview. Hmm. So we have two. And then the reason why I'm also telling you we have two is that our chairperson, Katie, has had too many conflicts with she has young children and hasn't been able to attend a number of meetings. So she is also stepping down. So we've got two openings, but we potentially have two applicants. We might have more, but definitely two. We've um, tried to encourage or been talking a little bit with the Historical Society about having a cross um, uh, person that is on both. Might not happen, but we might at least maybe get someone who at least might be interested in, in both, serving on both. Um, so there will be, my understanding is at least two, probably two interviews on the next council meeting on next Tuesday. Um, so that all leads us back to Anne is our Co or, uh, vice chair. She's been serving whenever Katie has not been able to be the chairperson. So technically we need to confirm if she wants to be the chair formally. We do need a vice chair for any meetings where she's not available. And we technically need a secretary because I've been taking minutes the last year or so um, because we did lose our secretary. The other Anne used to take all the minutes and she would submit them. You can probably see we keep them rather simple. Um, we have a basic format and it's pretty much just um, a pretty standard of typing in some of the basic of the visitor comments. Um, I have some pretty basic uh, information for the public hearing and I can give examples. So those are the things that we do need to take care of maybe before we get on to the old business. Um, and you can decide if you prefer to Again, wait until you get a couple more members on. If Anne is okay continuing to serve as the vice chair, I don't know. You guys can tell me what you want to do. Um, I mean, I'm happy to, you know, step in where needed. Um, I don't know how everyone else feels if we want to wait until we have some new members or if we want to decide on some things since all of us have been around now longer than the newer ones are going to be. And the only one you're technically missing tonight is Brendan. Brendan isn't here. Um, and then you would be getting two new members on. I think we can at a minimum uh, move forward with Anne as the new chair. because She's been on it for a a number of years and and knows the process and and maybe maybe the other two positions we could wait till the other two new members are here unless there's someone in the group tonight that is interested anyone <laughs> anyone <laughs> I know I have tenure now. I guess I'm the oldest, but <laughs> I'm just I'm I'm not wanting to take a leadership position. So if you'll indulge me on that one, <laughs> I'll just I'd just like to be a member. Um, I mean, I'm fine stepping into the chair role and then you know, if anybody else is interested in vice chair or secretary, or if we want to discuss that, you know, once we have the new members on and maybe once, you know, I don't know if we'll have a full, full quorum, um, you know, at the next meeting or whatnot. Um, I can tell you it's fun being vice chair. 
<laughs> well, tell you what, let, should we address these one at a time? And would it be appropriate to make a motion to confirm Anne as our chair? Yes, please. It's a good idea. I will move that we confirm Anne as our chair. I second. As the chair, you have to call for a vote. <laughs> so all of those in favor. Aye. 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 Is there anyone opposed? All right. You are now the formal chair. All right. Well, thank you, guys. So then do you want to address a vice chair this evening? Do you want to wait until you have Brendan back and other members? You can decide. And I'm currently taking minutes for this month's meeting. Thank you. <laughs> that is yeah, great. Laura, we appreciate that. Um, I mean, if there's nobody, if if there's nobody present that is interested in stepping into a vice chair role or secretary role, then I think we maybe wait until we have the new members um, and Brendan back to discuss this to see if there's interest there. I think that sounds like a solid plan. I'll put it on the agenda for next month. Good. So then I guess we're going to move on to the old business, which has been a number of months. <laughs> yes, is a discussion of future projects that we would. What do you guys want to do? Like what to tackle. Do you want to do? Um, Mara, it wasn't listed on here. I know at the June meeting it was brought up because we did have a visitor um, discussing the Douglas Hill project and uh, being vocal about the HPC possibly, you know, submitting a letter. Um, and I know it's not listed here, but I didn't know if, you know, where that kind of left off last time we talked about it, if we were interested in doing that. If so, if that's something that needs to take precedence because, you know, that project is, you know, currently in discussions. So just so you know, the timing of the project, um, it, the plan commission voted at their public hearing last night. Um, the vote was four to four. Um, so it went forward with um, neither a, you know, um, it, it was not a negative or a positive. It just went, it's going forward to council. Um, so in going forward to council, the next step is they will hold another public hearing with the city council. So we have put the ads in the paper, the council meeting that it will go to to start its public hearing is October 5th. So if there was something that you wanted to get into the formal packet of information for that, um, that would be something that you would probably want to do. So we have our next meeting. Um, October 12th. October 12th. It took me a second. I looked at Jim yeah. at the top and then... <laughs> So you're not meeting until October 12th. Now, um, typically on larger projects, they open the hearing and they sometimes keep it open for multiple meetings. So they might have it open for both the October 5th and then it would be two weeks later, so October 19th. Um, so there is still an opportunity if you all wanted to read um, the latest staff report. Um, so I'm gonna show you since I can go on the website. Um, the latest, oh, actually right here. The latest staff report is, oh, why am I having trouble? Sorry, I'm gonna open this up a little more. So over here under agendas and minutes of boards and commissions, you can then scroll down in the agenda center until you get to the plan commission. And under plan commission, it went for a public hearing both in or multiple times. It went in June, it went in July, it went in August, it went August 31st, and it went September 13th. Now the most recent one that they voted on, um, is actually in here. So this is our staff report. Um, and this staff report, sorry, here's the agenda. 
And our staff report is attached to the agenda. It's a hyperlink. Let's see how many PDFs I can open. Um, and they actually voted on um, a series of initial staff recommendations. So the first eight pages are a staff report, but it's just new information. If you keep going further back, our first staff report was like 26 pages long. Um, and there's a series of recommendations and that's what they voted on the other evening. So for example, um, that starts here. This is the list of all the uses, whether they're permitted or accessory or conditional. Um, this is additional information on uses. This is their density limitations, their site coverage, their height. Um, there is a set of setbacks. And just so you note, the um, existing church and the existing structure, which is a National Register Historic Structure, are both um, shown as remaining with a set of existing setbacks so that you know, they're not able to tear those down. Um, there's some other information about setbacks on the building. There's information on parking and loading, signage, lighting, architectural elements, um, parks, tree preservation, fire, access, access management, traffic studies, stormwater, floodplain, Bunch of other little things, subdivision platting. Um, there's some things on sustainability, recycling. Now they did make some changes, minor ones, but they made some changes. Um, but that's six pages long. So that's the set of recommendations. And what it is, is the way that a rezoning works for a planned commercial is they provide an initial plan. The plan commission then looks at a set of regulations of if they are gonna build it, what regulations would you put in place? what limitations would you put on it? And then you put that piece in play. So it goes through a review by planning commission. It then goes to city council. If city council then approves these regulations, they will come back with a development plan. So even though the first preliminary plan shows footprints and some other things, they have to come back with a plan that meets all the regulations that eventually get approved or, or might get approved by the council. So their next step is, is sort of approving regulations. They still have to follow everything in the Historic Preservation Code. They still have to follow everything in um, the International Building Codes. They have to follow. So and these are just special things above and beyond that weren't in the zoning code because they were um, rezoning to a planned district. So when it comes to and the I, that was a long drawn out description to explain to you that if you want to make um, any recommendations on certain things that are related to the historic uh, the historic uh, commission, you are going to want to put together all of your thoughts at in one and be able to use that. And as an example, the sustainability commission did something um, similar, and it's. Sorry, it's in this packet. So I'm going to scroll down until I can find it. This is the floodplain uh, part of the floodplain study. The floodplain study is about 500 pages. Sorry, I'm going to keep scrolling. I know that the sustainability letter is in here, so just so you can see what they their, that commission did. If I can jump, sorry, 57 pages. Public comments. Yeah, so here's what the Sustainability Commission did. Um, it had, on behalf of the commission, they wanted to share as a group certain things, uh, what their concerns were and how to address those concerns. They had some information on maximizing pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure, ensuring pedestrian connections, um, maximizing the use of the permeable surfaces for stormwater runoff, shared parking, um, green space. So all of these were things that they had suggested that were tied to their commission. Um, and so they sent that as a group letter and then we put it into the packets. So it could be something similar you could do. I know uh, Dave's concerns, I think were a little bit more on um, maybe trying to get out more of the history. Um, and I know he had some connections 
So that might be something that if you all wanted to pursue and bring back, you would have time between the two meetings, um, between the both the two city council meetings to get a letter in. So it's not too late. Okay. Um, I don't know what everybody else's thoughts are on this. If you feel that it's necessary for our group to um, provide a letter regarding this project, or if we want to just continue our focus on some of the other ideas of projects we've discussed in the past. Which Mara, I don't know, did Dave ever um, send you his information that he had as far as the histor historic findings that he presented? If I remember correctly, it wasn't much more than what he verbally told you. There really wasn't much uh, in terms of specifics, but I can go back and look. I mean, I, I guess I just didn't know, you know, basically that was him coming to us and talking about what he knows about it, but I didn't know if that's enough of a source for something for us to go off of or if we would have to do you know, more of our own research on it. Additional research. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and if he had um, specific like um, sources of other people who were, um, that he had the, the information from. So like, for example, I believe he had gotten information from other people. I yes. have his email. Thank you some of which he got from the Historical Society. Um, and then he's named some specific people. people. I guess, do we know, is the Historical Society doing anything like this on their behalf? Not that I'm aware of. Not that I'm aware of either, but I do have a a voicemail that I need to answer about something else with the Historical Society that I hadn't gotten a chance to call. So I can definitely ask Ginger um, if they were planning to do anything, but I don't, I don't think so. He's also citing things from the North Webster uh, walking tour brochure, which also originated with the Historical Society and the North Webster Coalition. Thank you for having that. I forgot to grab it. So I, I was just gonna say, so even if you do wanna do this, I don't see this as necessarily a larger project. I think that would be just something we could definitely put on the next agenda if you would like to, you know, if everyone wants to, I can re-forward the email from, what date did I send that? Uh, June 10th. Ah, okay. <laughs> so two days after our meeting. Um, I can re-forward it to everyone and then you can decide if anyone wants to take a stab at um, starting to draft some things that are of concern. Um, again, do note, we didn't give any specifics. There is only one historic national register structure on the property. That doesn't mean that there isn't anything else on the property that might have some significance in terms of buildings. I think a lot of what Dave was focusing on was a little bit more of the history of the land. He, it was. I was just reading it again. A lot of it is talking about how they held services under the trees and uh, those kinds of things. So it might be worth sending it back to everybody, um, putting it on the agenda for next meeting, and then you all can decide if you really feel as you come back together that you want to write something, that you kind of figure out your points, dedicate one person to actually crafting or drafting it, um, and then you can send it on. I can take it and put it, make sure it gets submitted for the packet. Okay, I think that's a good idea um, if we have it on the next month's agenda. And I guess um, those of you who are kind of interested in this or thinking of things that we could compile into um, the letter, you know, maybe just jot them down for the next meeting or, you know, I don't know, Mara, if it's something that 
we can email to you. And I know without meeting, it's kind of tricky. Yep. So I can, first I can resend Dave's email to everybody. And then if anyone replies back directly to me, you can't reply to each other and have a conversation via email. But if you send it to me, I can bring all your pieces together and then bring it back to you with, here's what different people have said so that it could be a little bit more productive at the next meeting. Okay, I think that's a good plan. So then I guess do we want to discuss the future projects? I know it seems every meeting we start talking about it, but we've had you know members out or now we're hopefully anticipating two new members. So I don't know if that's something we want to keep discussing at this time. Does anybody have any thoughts on that? I think it would be nice if our group did something proactive with the historic project, uh, whether it be Lustrum Homes, the Sears Kit Homes, another Webster Walk. It's been a number of years since we've done something like that. I know too at the last meeting, um, Stephen, you had brought up, you know, the Joy Belt home. Hold on just a second, Anne. We can't hear anything because we've got the fire. <laughs> okay, they're gone. Can you Assuming say that again? Like those vehicles. <laughs> Can you say that again? Um, I know Stephen had brought up the joy built uh, homes that was something that he was interested in and I'm uh, I think you said you do have some research that you've already done on, on I have a little bit and I forwarded that to Mara I don't know if you had a chance to, to look at that email I had it? glanced at it and then thought oh we'll talk about it at the next meeting and the next meeting didn't happen ah okay so I can resend the joy built I mean again I think all of these are almost smaller manageable projects because you've got you know when it comes to lustron there's a limited number still in webster groves mm -hmm. when it comes to sears kit homes again sort of a limited number there might be some others we haven't found yet but there's a limited number and i would say also with the joy builds um, so you could take on multiple of those um, we talked about the possibility of doing a new walk with the three of them, but as more like little, um, like more of a driving tour that you would do some sort of driving and you could have almost the three routes on top of one another of drive to the Lustron, drive to the Sears kit, drive to the Joy Build. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, those are possibilities where you could kind of bring them all together. And you can always do subcommittees. So like, for example, Katie Struts had said, she was, or, or she had said, um, you know, if, if you had another subcommittee that was meeting, that wasn't meeting at our regular time, she would be happy to still be involved. Um, and I would think that if you also potentially either have, if either of those two members or hopefully both of them that are interviewing, again, one is an architect, who focuses on historic and the other one used to be on the commission when uh, they think he was on when we did the um, the medallions, the historic medallions. Mm -hmm. um, and I think he was on when they did the lecture series. So between those two, you might be able to get some smaller subcommittees to break these elements up. And then look at the possibility of whether there's some research that can be done to create it. And you might be able to get Bill Wickman, who has been doing stuff for the Historical Society and then the other walks. He might be able to, again, not necessarily serve, but he could work on a project together with you all as a possibility. So Mara, with the, with the existing walks, do all of the properties that are listed in those historic walks, do they have the medallions too? Do those go hand in hand? Certainly not for the North Webster walk no. because okay. so many of the things named in it no longer exist. You're looking at an empty lot where mm -hmm. the goat farm was mm -hmm. or buildings that have been repurposed for other things. So 
and, and no sidewalks. So yeah. there really aren't any medallions for that one. But uh, I was president of the Historical Society when we did that. And there was such an interest from the Northwestern Coalition that their history be recognized that it was a joint venture with the Historical Society and the Northwestern Coalition. Um, the, the Joy Belt houses are referred to, I think, in the Webster Park walk, but there's not a lot of history of Joy and what, what that was all about. So that might be something to focus on outside of, of that walk. The president has kind of been set with that North Webster walk that it's not real walkable. There are parts of it that are walkable, but it's really not, uh, it's not like the other walks. Mm -hmm. So one, uh, as Mara mentioned, something that you might drive from house to house certainly would be uh, a precedent that's sort of been started anyway. And I guess with like the Lustron, I know kind of when we talked about it last meeting, or it might have been the one before that, um, you pulled the list that was put together a couple of years ago of the Lustron houses. And there are quite a few that are no longer standing. There's some that are still there, but have completely been sided over or look completely different. So I guess, you know, I think the Lustron is interesting. And then I know also there's a bunch of them or, you know, a street of them in Brentwood. So it's not necessarily, you know, a Webster Groves thing. And obviously there's more history to Lustron than that. But so I guess I'm just kind of wondering how to go about compiling, you know, what we have left or do we put what was there and is no longer there. I mean, it's a pretty short list in Webster. So, I mean, it would be something that someone would be able to, sorry, I jumped onto Indiana's long list. Um, I think I put the list in the packet. I'm trying to remember. This was a National Register nomination for another, uh, for Indiana, I believe. Um, but I think I put it at the very back of the packet. I mean, again, you could have different subcommittees that different people get assigned to it. I thought I put it in the packet, but I guess I didn't. Um, but I'd be able to get that information, that original list, and be able to give it to someone, again, depending on who wanted to take certain elements on. And we'd be able to find out, you know, which ones are still in Webster. They're not all in good repair. No. They the aren't. one I know Watson is. Oh, that one's in very terrible bad. disrepair. And we do know um, there was one on Simmons that was demolished. There was one on okay. Hart that was demolished, both of them for new homes. I know of two that have been demolished since I've been here um, for new construction. There's still one in North Webster and, and the one on Edgar. The, yep, there's the one on the Edgar. Ed, the Edgar one's noticeable. Um, and then there's a couple more on either Simmons or Pappin, but they're just not as, some of them have been cited over. So when you look at the mm -hmm. pictures and you look at, mm -hmm. um, and you actually go there, it's a little bit harder to see what's still left of it. Sometimes it's the roof. Sometimes it's the supports on the carport. Yes. You have to look for. Yeah. So we do have a short list. Telltale things. And it seems like all of these have a, like a history to them that might be fascinating mm -hmm. that someone doesn't know. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a lot of people who don't know about Lustron. There's a lot of people who, surprisingly, who don't know about Sears Kit Homes. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, know a little bit about the Joy Built Homes. So, you know, those three could be that you're telling a story um, about, you know, sort of something about that and then just tie it in with a, with a driving walk or a driving tour. Mm -hmm. Well, in the Lustron Homes, can you remind me again, like when they started being built? Was it the 50s? Yes. So kind of similar to a little bit after Sears hit homes. I was trying to remember. But yeah, it, it's a little bit more of a mid-century modern, almost into the 60s. 
let's see if I can with that, that I mean it might be a, easier than say like a century home to find the original owner of the property and if you know sorry I'm trying to get in and see I'm gonna find you know somebody who maybe grew up in those houses so end of World War II first lustrons actually 1948 And I know at one point for the list that we had, we did have the owners because a previous, uh, the commission in doing this research, other members on the commission a number of years ago, we're trying to make them potentially a historic, um, they were gonna nominate them as their own sort of set of historic structures. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so we did have um, contact information because I believe a letter was sent. And I still have somewhere in the files the letter that was sent, um, but I think that they just didn't get a lot of um, response back um, in regards of owners who were interested in making it a historic, making them historic structures. I think there was concern that there would be some restrictions on them, on their ability to make changes to their homes, is what I, I heard. Which makes sense. You yeah. Know, you hear that all the time. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think it's such an interesting, you know, style and the story about how they came to be. And, you know, if we could dig back through, um, you know, real estate records and whatnot and, and come up with maybe the original purchaser, you know, person who built each one of these. And, and then you a can... reminder, and again, it would take a little bit of time and I'm not gonna remember the link exactly. Hold on, the Webster Groves Library has now scanned all the building permits in. Mm -hmm. um, so you can now look up, I found my 1940 building permit for my house, um, which was really cool. Um, so um, building permits. I have the link at, um, at uh, House Street. Uh, I might not be able to find it right now, but I um, they do have a way that you can now look them up. They're all scanned in. Um, History of Homes, Heritage, Microfilm. They did the microfilm. It's a link and I'll have to find it, but they scanned them all in. And so if you, knowing that the time frame is only 1948 to 1950, mm -hmm. someone could look and if you have the addresses of them, that's mm -hmm. how I found mine. I knew that my house was built in around 1940 mm -hmm. and I started at the beginning of 1940 and just scanned through each one and it was March. So I, I managed mm -hmm. to find the, the builder um, who he built, you know, who, who they, he built it for himself and the dates and then how much it costs to build the house. Um, so it could be something that someone could do some research and I could send that out um, for that link. Yeah, and I think it would be interesting then if we oh, could find look. an original owner. Um, you know, maybe even call. going through like ancestry or whatnot, we can find descendants of who lived in, in the house. Yeah, so here's the building permits. And when you go into that, so here's each of the books, 1908, 1909. So if you started with, uh, I'm gonna guess it's maybe on page three. Oh, even older, 1950. Well, 1950 is when they stopped. So let me go back one more. Are you page still on the Webster two. side? Um, this is the, County? No, this is actually our library, our Webster library. This is Webster oh, Groves Library. Oh, oh okay. Okay. Yeah, um, and Michael happened to find it. He was able to send it to me. Um, Good job, Michael. Um, so if you go to read, um, what it does is it actually just puts them all in here. So you can just go mm -hmm. page by page and you can um, see each permit and you can see the address. So this is uh, on St. James. And let's see, Locust Court. So if someone could go through and if you knew which addresses you were looking for, you could see <clears throat> when it was potentially um, built and who it was built for. I mean, it could be pretty cool. Yeah. But yes, if you have just a year to work with, you can work through a window of time. 
it just may take some time for someone to do the research. Yeah, I think that would definitely be interesting for these, just because it seems more pop more likely you could find somebody who maybe grew up in one of them and and you know if we're mm -hmm. doing a walk you would be able to get kind of personal firsthand you know knowledge of what it was like living in one do you think we could combine those with the sears kit houses so that we have a a they're like, both kit houses in effect yeah that's one thing they have in common mm -hmm. And then you have like a sort of a, a number of them instead of just, you know, a, a small spot. Group thing. Yeah, mm -hmm. a small group thing. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that's interesting is you don't necessarily have to have a full walk. It, you know, the, the drive could be just about the this little grouping and it could be a smaller something. Yeah. That someone who maybe isn't as interested in some of the older and is a little bit more interested in something that comes starts coming into the 40s and the 50s mm -hmm. there are people that are interested in that era mm -hmm. um so you, you do have the ability to to keep it tight but i think once you get the sears kit homes in with those and they are a very similar time frame and mm -hmm. thinking about being kits um also the impact of the railroad being here Mm -hmm. impacted their ability to be delivered mm -hmm. um so all of that kind of can tie in together so it, and what i could do i could pull together again the rest of the information that we have on lustron and sears kit they're in this agenda but we can still like focus on them i could find the rest of the information that we had on the lustron and we can send out this link for the library. But I think you'd need to kind of divvy up who's doing what to figure out like what you want to come together for the project. Stephen, do you think that there are a number of joy built houses that would make up a, a collection that was large enough? Yes, I absolutely do. Um, the, the joy building company actually had 20 acres adjacent to the current theological seminary property that they built along Joy Avenue. Uh, so there were probably 50 homes in there, I guess. Um, and then there are scattered houses throughout town, throughout the town that were built both by Edward and Justin and then his son through the years. So Joy Build is actually, Joy is actually a builder, and we're talking about specific homes built by that builder. Is that what that is? Yes, absolutely. Okay. And were they a particular style, or they were just various uh, designs or architectures oh, that they were all built by this builder? Oh, they were all, all, all styles. Some of them were, were very nondescript. Some of them were a little fanciful. Uh, I live in one. It I don't know if anybody knows what my house is. It's a stucco castle looking thing on, on Rock Hill. Weren't they kind of like known for doing stucco on um, a lot of their builds? Uh, not on a, uh, I don't know. I don't know that a lot of them were. I mean, there are, there are a lot of uh, siding houses, uh, brick. They, they, they were all over the map. Um, so I guess Mara, if we want to decide if there's anybody here who is interested in going through this link um, based on, you know, if we want to say, okay, you take the list of lustrons and kind of go through to find the permits. Um, if we should have one or two people doing that, I don't know really what the best way would be to break some of this up. I guess the question is, do you want to you're missing essentially a third of your group. So do we want to at least for the next agenda, this is your project. And then we I identify as much information as we already have on all of them. So the stuff that we've already received that I have about the joy belt that's already been researched, the information that we already have on Sears kit and the information on Lustron, put all that into that next packet 
and then be able to divvy it up from there. Because right now we're still missing a few bits and pieces of some of the stuff that I have. Mm -hmm. um, and that might help you for, I mean, I hate pushing it off, but at least you picked a project. You've picked yeah. a, here's what we wanna work on. And then once you have the rest of your members and the possibility of seeing if you have, if you wanna form some smaller subcommittees of, you know, these three people take on Lustron and these three take on Joy Built and these take on Sears Kit, you might be able to do that. And then you might be able to get additional people who are not currently on the commission who might be interested and you're allowed to add members to your subcommittees that aren't appointed. So that's always the thing that people forget about that works out great. One of the things that's running through my mind is but we're almost talking about uh, a timeline of decades and the kinds of houses that were coming to Webster Groves at a particular time. I live in a neighborhood where they were building houses for soldiers coming home from World War II. Uh, many houses look alike. They were putting them up as fast as they could, but we know we still have some log houses in Webster Groves. We know that when the railroad came through, you could start getting construction materials by the railroad. And if you take a house like Hawken House, nothing was ready-made. They had to make everything. So that's another era. And then we get into the era where you could get the kinds of kits we're talking about. And maybe that's a way to organize it rather than just uh, a particular style of house, but a time that they were built and what houses were during periods of time. I don't know, just a thought. When you were at the, when you were active at the historic, you may still be, but did you have an interest in any of these types of homes at that time? I've always been interested in the types mean, of homes, as, but, but I mean, no, as far no, as not, like not one of these of this designations. No, yeah. I just think it's interesting to think that the evolution started with log homes. Mm -hmm. And they changed radically when railroads came in. So we're talking mm -hmm. about the end of the 19th century when you could get things shipped and the kinds of houses were a result of that. Yeah. And then kits came into being because of those railroads. I mean, that's, that's yeah. one of the things that drove the home building industry, so. So Mara, I think you have a good plan as far as, you know, that we, compile what we have and then at the next meeting kind of go over what we have maybe assign you know some some research aspects to each other or discuss if we you know form a subcommittee I guess my question with a, a project like this do you leave it open-ended or you know in the past when you guys have had projects do you say okay we want this completed by X time, just so maybe it kind of puts a little more motivation to completing it. Um, I don't know kind of how that's been in the past. So I know there were some ones in the past and I know Doug was here for part of that where they kind of floated. They just, they never, they weren't getting finished. They weren't getting finished. And so we tried, um, this was right before COVID. We finally finished the monument that went for the Douglas School. And mm -hmm. then we finally finished the tree in the library for all the historic markers of the historic structures. And we finally finished the code amendment that we were trying to do to get um, it so that you could look at um, 50 or, or older houses and not have everybody coming in with the 95 year old house that could just be torn down with no permission. So we kind of had a problem where they were floating around. The agendas used to have this long list of all these potential projects that were always on the bottom of the agenda. And we finally said, we've got to stop doing that. You've got to get focused. So a little bit was tied to the budget year. So the July 1 to June 30 became a per an important thing so that if you were asking for a budget, so for example, if you had decided that you wanted someone to go out and get professional photos of all these various homes, if you needed to put that in your budget, that was something we would ask for. And you usually have to ask for that in around March. 
in order for it to get into the budget where I can put it into the budget to make the request so that you can start using it if it gets approved by July 1. Um, so there were some things, now do you know, like the printing costs that we do for the walks, the, the little books, that's an automatic, it's in my budget as a planning department budget every year to continue. We have boxes and boxes of them up in the attic and then we just bring them down as we need to refill. Um, but things like when we built, when we did do the new walk, the North Webster walk, we had to put extra money in because we knew it, it was so popular. They were gone and we had to do a whole nother printing right away. So just some of those things. And then um, I know they had put some money into an actual someone to do the research a little bit more. So they hired, I think it was Lynn Jotzi mm -hmm. um, and she did uh, the research on that. So it kind of comes down to sometimes it depends on availability of members. And then sometimes it depends on just the direction. And, um, but I would assume that what you want to do is have an end point to your project. So, and determine is this project something that you want to stay just mobile, that you want it in a paper form? Um, are there different elements to what you want to do? Because those will have different implications. And I think that would be a further discussion as you get closer. But I would say that right now, think about this as being a project that you want to be working on through June at the latest. Um, it's, it's a lot of work, um, but that could be a good way to just give yourself a, an end point. Okay. So I guess, is everybody okay with this kind of new plan of this is the project we want to proceed with? Um, obviously bringing this up at our next meeting when we ha hopefully have some new members um, and possibly forming subcommittees. Yeah, I think that, I think both plans would, would be viable. The Lustrum plus the Sears kit is one and the other being the joy build homes. I think that they would both be uh, worthy projects that would be well received. Mm -hmm. And, and even I, if you tie it back to how Jane talked about um, decades, yeah. you could do them as a whole small series. This could be the first three in your series about sort of the decades of the types of a building style or, or a types of how they built you could start with a series of those and then you could even go back to the original here are our oldest oldest lo log cabins type mm -hmm. and then you could get into some of the mid-century modern that we have kind of scattered around webster groves mm -hmm. so that you could do a, a it might almost be a smaller series of of mm -hmm. of books of some sort of almost like a walk but so you have a lot of options i think with mm -hmm. what you what you have I will pull everything together for the next agenda. I will put on the Douglas Hill. I will also send to all of you uh, Dave's email um, so that you can get responses back to me. And then I'll pull together everything I have on what has been sent to me for Joy Built, what we have in the files for Lustron and Sears Kit. And then we'll put those three items on so that you can discuss them each as an element and figure out who you want to assign or who wants to volunteer for different parts. Okay, sounds good. And, and if there's printing involved with these walks, you don't have to ask council for that? If it's simply printing, um, I already have a general printing budget. And right okay. now, I know that because we now do have some of them online, there hasn't been as much, I, we're not filling them as quickly. Um, I think a lot of people, right as the pandemic started, we sent out the digital ones as like a tweet or a Facebook post saying, hey, mm -hmm. this has become very popular. Everyone's walking around because they need to get out of their houses. Mm -hmm. And um, we saw sort of an uptick that we could see on our website, I believe, of people clicking on them. Um, so I think we've got that option, but yes, I have a printing budget for the year, 
Um, and even if we get to the end of the year, we could put it in my printing budget for the following year, for the next July 1, if we got the project done in time. Um, so yeah, that would not have to be a special council ask. The special council asks were like, when we had to get the whole monument carved and set by the, the, the monument company. And then okay. when we had to get the person to cut out and build that tree, that beautiful tree for yeah. in the library. Okay. Those were more special things that we had to ask for. Okay. When it comes to some of the other general stuff, I do have some in my budget that can work. Okay, does anybody else have anything else to offer or any questions? Maybe, maybe a question for Karen from the council. Is this something that you think the council would want us to be focused on? Uh, well, yes, I don't, I don't think that the council would have any objective, any objection to that because I mean, again, the whole purpose, you know, based upon what we have in the ordinance is for the commit is, is for the historical preservation commission to do exactly what you're doing to promote the history um of, of the city to make it um to, to make the differences and the distinctions that the city offers from a historical perspective to the community and and not just the community of webster groves but at large just to share with with the public the civic pride and, and what Webster has to offer from a historical perspective. So, you know, I mean, we're, we're not going to say we want you to do this, 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 and this, but what we're going to, what we've done is basically provided an outline to say what we would like to see from the historic preservation is activities and information and communication to inform the public on the history of Webster Groves. And so this is perfectly in line with that. Good. Thank you for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there anything else? Should I make a motion to adjourn the September meeting? So moved. I second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Some of us have to drive home. <laughs> <laughs> I think the rain stopped. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Um, I'm so glad we had a quorum. Have a good evening and uh, stay safe this week. Yeah, you guys be safe driving home. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.